All right, we're going to get started in just one minute. So, Settle and hope everyone's having a great session so far. I want, I want to remind you that um, at the end of each session, you're going to see a QR code on the speaker's final slides. And that's to help uh, give them feedback and to give us feedback overall. So um, there's also Ask the Experts. And I've been asked to remind you about this. A lot of our speakers have been able to defer some really awesome questions to those sessions. But they'll be out in the main expo hall throughout the day. There's also a really cool community booth there to check out where we have a local MongoDB user group leader. But right now, I'm going to have the honor of bringing Jeff up onto the stage. Let me cue up your, in, your awesome intro here. Jeff Needham is Principal of Industry Solutions at MongoDB, leading the healthcare and insurance verticals and brings close to 25 years of data and solution architecture experience. Before joining MongoDB, Jeff was a senior director of architecture for Travelers Insurance, where he was instrumental in helping the organization adopt MongoDB as a database of choice as part of a large-scale enterprise modernization effort. Jeff also brings experience working in several other software companies, as well as Aetna Healthcare. Please give a warm welcome to Jeff Needham. And, uh, thanks, folks. Hey, thanks for coming this morning. Uh, we really appreciate everybody that comes here, uh, that comes to all the MongoDB events. Um, there's just such a good energy from the people that work here, from the customers. Um, I'm here to talk to you about mainframe modernization. We only have 30 minutes. I apologize. This could be a really detailed topic. Typically, we'll take about 90 minutes on a customer Zoom to talk about this. So what I've tried to do today is sort of boil the essence of uh, modernizing mainframes. But you can apply this to Oracle, to SQL Server, any of us that work in companies with legacy systems uh, that have to compete with these sort of digital startups uh, and disruptors who don't have uh, <laughs> legacy systems. This is really what this talk is going to be about. If we live for another 500 years on the planet, I think one thing that will be forever etched into the memory of human existence is the fact that we went to the moon. It may fade into myth and lore. We might forget who went there, how we got there. But I think this is one thing that will always stand out. It took some 400,000 people to make that happen. Scientists, engineers, mathematicians, factory workers building things. What's really interesting, though, is the Saturn V instrument unit. And Google this, because it's kind of neat. The Saturn V instrument unit was a computer that was on board the rocket that, that took the astronauts out of the atmosphere and got them into lun lunar trajectory. Now, this was kind of important, because if you miss the lunar orbit and you don't orbit the moon, you just drift endlessly out into space for maybe another 500 years. The computer that got the astronauts to the moon into lunar orbit um, it had something like 4,096 words of 26 bits each. The memory where the computer program was stored was actually woven in wire. The computer program was written on a mainframe, but it was woven in wire by actually what NASA called LOL memory, little old lady memory. They took women who were good at weaving, and they actually took the computer program that was written for the Saturn V rocket, and they wove it into wire that represented ones and zeros. It's fascinating if you look at this up. The astronauts at the time argued with the engineers. These guys are test pilots. They're like, we can do this ourselves. We can have manual control of the rocket. The engineers won, and it's probably a good thing. Uh, Apollo 12, this, the mission after the first mission to the moon where you know, Neil Armstrong and, and Buzz Aldrin set down on the moon's surface, Apollo 12 as the rocket's leaving the launch pad, as it's moving into, or, uh, into the air, gets hit by lightning twice, knocks out the controls for the ast ast astronauts. It's a good thing there's this computer on board actually helping this thing get into the right trajectory. It's firing the engines. It's telling the engines when to, when to stop, when, when to separate one sequence from the next. And again, this thing is built on a mainframe. It's built and written. That program was written on a mainframe by folks at, up at MIT. It was tested on a mainframe. But the mainframes weren't the size of rooms by then. They were the size of really big refrigerators. And you needed more than one of them. 
And so the NASA engineers determined that these things weren't flight ready. They were too big and they were too heavy. But look this up on Google. It's really neat. The Saturn V instrument unit, it was built by IBM, but it was built on a mainframe. The mainframes at that time here in 1964 were known as System 360. This is really neat because these mainframes are the first mainframes, the first computers where you can have varying levels of hardware that run the same software. If you have a small mainframe or a, a, you know, a junior mainframe and a large mainframe with more CPU power, you could actually run the very same software on the small box and the, the large box. And prior to that, you had to really customize the software explicitly for the hardware. But if we fast forward all the way to system Z here in 2000, which stands for zero downtime, What's fascinating, there's only two generations of mainframe in between 64, 1964 and 2000. System Z will run computer programs written in the 60s for System 360. It's backward compatible. So if anybody tells you our mainframes are going to be defunct in 10 years, we're going to need to write the code, actually, mm, not so much. But we're going to get to the problems of the mainframes in, in, in a couple slides. But what's really neat about the mission to the moon is the Saturn V instrument unit at the time was the world's largest autonomous device. This thing has gyroscopes, it has accelerometers, it has an onboard computer receiving all this information, making adjustments based upon the computer program that was written. It's also streaming data down to the mission controllers in Houston, just a few hundred miles north here. They stream the data and the System 360 mainframes translated the data from what they would call, they called shorthand. These guys did not have Avro binary back in the 60s, but they, they had to truncate the size of the, the messages coming out of the rocket, streaming back down to the Earth, because they wanted to fit more information in. It's also the year that information management system, or it's also the era that gave us information management system, one of the two databases that we're really here to talk about today, right? Host DB2 and host IMS. IMS was created by IBM for the mission to the moon because there were so many parts suppliers, so many assemblers, so many engineers at NASA ordering things. They needed an inventory, an order, and uh, you know, management system, and that was what IMS was. IMS went to market in 1969 with I, uh, IBM went to market in 1969 with IMS commercially, but it was built for the mission to the moon. But we're here to talk about not the mission to the moon. This is a little storytelling, hopefully, to make the presentation a little bit more interesting. We're here to talk about mainframe modernization and bringing uh, your organizations into this era of what we call digital readiness. The mission to the moon, in my opinion, was fascinating because in 1961, President Kennedy gives this charge. And at the time, there's no possible way that you, the US has the means. We don't know how to navigate to the moon. We don't know how to get to the moon. We don't really know how to get out of Earth's orbit. We have no technology, we have no capability. The mission pushed the boundaries of the technology in terms of what was available. It pushed the boundaries of the technology to meet the objective. Today, we are surrounded by so much technology. We wear the technology, we have the technology in the cloud. There are so many capabilities technology-wise that the pendulum is swinging the other way. The technology is now providing the ability to innovate on the business side of the house now in a way that's never been uh, uh, possible before. In that space, I think there's digital leaders and there's digital laggards. And we talk about how to modernize, sorry, we talk about why to modernize in this kind of context of digital readiness. There are four capabilities, digitally speaking, that I think are really important for us to talk about. And it's IoT, data connectivity, connected devices, um, Automation, we've had automation in manufacturing forever with robots, machine learning. You know, if I have connected devices, if I have like 10,000 patients in some health program collecting all this information from wearables in terms of heart rate and temperature, I need to be able to make sense of that information quickly. I need machine learning to be able to comb through the amount of data that's now being ingested. And I need automation. I can't, um, I can't alert a physician or a patient manually. I need something that's going to say, hey, the machine learning model found an anomaly. This is a pre potential precursor to some catastrophic health condition. I want to send an automated alert to, to the patient's watch, the physician's dashboard. And then augmented reality and virtual reality for, for virtual training and simulation. 
Digital transformation is such a nebulous term. We hear it so much, but I think this notion of digital readiness with these four capabilities, connectivity, machine learning, automation, and AR, VR, are kind of a nice way to kind of frame it up and say these are the capabilities that really are digital transformation. At the same time, the leaders are also embracing the fact that we've all been groomed to expect these really great mobile experiences from our phones. It could just be a retail application that I use, but now I'm gonna demand that from my insurer, I'm gonna demand that from my, my healthcare organization that I, that I buy a policy from. Um, I want that seamless user experience to also have real-time data. I want it to have personalized data. And the last part of this is we can't forget about the employees. Um, there's a kind of a neat article from Harvard Business Review here, and the author did a really good job summarizing the fact that the applications that we've been used to building over the last 10 to 20 years, they don't really talk to each other well. So as a business user, I might have to copy paste from one app to the next to the next during the course of my day-to-day -day, uh, activities. And so I'm in this kind of swivel chair mode. So we want to we want all these digital capabilities. We want seamless digital web and mobile experiences. We want to give that to our employees too. And these things are kind of what build this story of digital readiness and who's a leader in this space and who's not. So our challenge here is to really say, well, we, we're not a digital startup. We've got mainframes. Clearly, we've been around for, for more than a few years as, as a company. So how can we emulate the disruptors and the startups so we can remain competitive with them and still deal with the fact that we have legacy systems. And what we use is this term platform architecture. What are the leaders building in terms of an architecture model and can we emulate them? Obviously, they're building platforms where all or some aspect of the products and services that I've purchased as a customer or a consumer, I can interact in that same platform. These platforms are being underpinned by these digital capabilities. Machine learning and automation and AR, VR are shaping the data and delivering the data to the platform and giving the users the compelling experiences. They're, they're, they're the ones that are, these digital capabilities are giving the differentiated experience from one company to the next. And they sit right under the platform. But here's where it's really important. They're building single views. They're building these core data domains. They're embracing domain-driven design and they're building this notion of one service. You know, If I took half of this room and I said, okay, we're gonna be a brand new insurance company, we're gonna have this startup, and I'm gonna create five software delivery teams on the right side of the, the room here. Each one of those teams is gonna build a customer administration system. I'm gonna build five customer administration systems. I'm not gonna do that, right? I'm gonna build one. But we know in the mainframe world, in the legacy world, we have five. There's, a, there's an insurer, a large insurer, not travelers, who told us they have 55 systems where they administer policies. This is a challenge. I'm not gonna build a machine learn, learning model 55 times against 55 different legacy data models. I'm gonna build that once. So what I really need is a, an operational data layer. I need to encapsulate the legacy complexity with an operational data layer strategy. This is something that we did really well at Travelers, but this is something that's one of our most popular use cases here at MongoDB. It's an incremental way away from the mainframes, away from the legacy systems. It's a way for us to wrap up that legacy complexity and begin to emulate the leaders, emulate the startups, build greenfield applications, hire the best of breed developers who don't wanna deal with green screens and terminals, data streams, and so that's really what we're gonna talk about this morning in, the, in the, the second half of the presentation is how do we bring our mainframes into this era of platforms? How do we bring the mainframes into the era of core data domains and data services? As practitioners in this space, again, this is a, a short presentation on this topic, but I think we need to know three things, and this is kind of a simplified view of the world but I think you need to know how to move the data from your legacy systems. You need to know where you're gonna put that data. And then you're gonna to have to figure out how do I scale a program inside my organization around that. And these three things really shape up, in my opinion, what it means to modernize incrementally away from legacy systems 
and bring your organization into the platform era without spending first maybe 10 years and $10 million to replace legacy systems. I wanna do this while the car is running. I wanna build really compelling digital experiences and compelling digital products in the next six to 18 months. I'm not gonna to touch the host. I'm not gonna to touch the code. I'm gonna wrap it up and copy the data out. So that's what we're gonna talk about in the next 15 minutes. There's only three things I think really matter in terms of how to move the data. And I think we need to talk about modernization patterns. We definitely need to talk about change data capture processes. And we need to talk about team structure and domain-driven design and, and an event-based architecture. In modernizing, you have to figure out for that use case, what is your goal? For a lot of us, just copying the data out and being able to read that all in one place is a win. And that might be where you stop and say, this is good enough for this particular use case. I have 55 policy issuance systems. If I copy the data out and I put it into one, I can build brand new APIs. I can build a single source of truth. I can point machine learning against that full breadth of the data. I don't have this 55 system round trip where 55 minutes later, I've got the data for the mobile user. And it's like, well, I, well, I was gone at 15 seconds. An enriched ODL is sort of the next evolution on top of that. An enriched ODL means uh, maybe I've got legacy information. Maybe I've got patient preferences. I've got treatment options. And now I'm going to go to market like GE Healthcare did with some new uh, hospital and wearable devices. And so now I'm going to stream in data from a patient. And I'm going to now correlate that to the data that I got out of the host in terms of preferences. And then I'm gonna generate an alert based upon the data coming from the watch and the preferences that the patient set. So that was really sort of like, a, that's like an enriched ODL scenario where not only do I need to copy the data out of the host, but I need to join it with some new data and that's how I go to market with some new product and new service. A parallel write scenario could be, we, at Travelers we used to joke about the mainframes. The DBAs at Travelers called them real time uh, real-time mainframes, but they were down on weekends. <laughs> they were down on Sundays, and they were down from like one in the morning to three in the morning for all the backups, the batch jobs, the, the database run stats and reorgs that had to run. So we used to joke about real-time. But here's an example, parallel right, where maybe I've got so much data coming in and the host is down. How do I capture that data and have 24-7 availability in a cloud uh, database deployment and a cloud solution and then eventually backload the data into the mainframe. So that would be a parallel write scenario. Or maybe I have so much data coming in, or I want to be in a mobile application, and I don't want the data to come in through CICS or COBOL. <laughs> I want to actually have a mobile application to capture the data, but I want that data to then eventually get backfilled into the host. System of transaction might be where um, I'm actually transacting against a brand new distributed application and I'm creating new information, like maybe it's a brand new product and service, but some of that, the fact that I created a new customer, I want to capture the customer attributes and put that into my customer mainframe, but all of the new data, new attributes don't go into the host, but I need that data backfilled into the host for maybe billing or reporting purposes. All the way at the top of the spectrum here, system of record, where 50 years from now, we shut our hosts down and they're all running against MongoDB and we have these great brand new distributed applications. But you can find yourself in any one of these points depending upon your use case. This isn't just like a gradual evolution. This is really on a use case by use case basis. You have to determine what's my, what's my modernization strategy and what's my pattern here. This is probably the most important, but it's so important and so detailed I'm going to spend very little time on this one because we can talk for an hour on this. But as practitioners of legacy modernization, you have to be obsessed in CDC. The this, this first bullet here should say obsess with CDC. And I say invest in the utility because CDC utilities are worth their weight in gold. Because what you really want to do is get the data out as quickly as you can and then build some new application on top of that so you can prove to your business, check it out. I just got the data out, I put it in MongoDB, I built, you know, I built enterprise search um, of all, your, all the policy data across those 55 systems, something that you could never do before. You, you basically really wanna wow your product owner as soon as possible so they give you funding to keep going. 
But the CDC utility is going to allow you to, to spend a lot less time on configuration and a lot more time on that business logic and new feature. The best CDC utilities are log-based because they don't interfere with production database workloads. You know, the logs uh, give us the deltas. The logs are actually stored on a different disk usually than the actual application uh, database. In Travelers, I didn't have the luxury of uh, CDC utilities, so we, we built our own. You can do this on your own using IMS exit routines and DB2 triggers as a means to get the deltas out of the production database as soon as they hit the database into MQQs, or you can then consume those deltas. Um, definitely find me afterwards or find your, your uh, MongoDB account rep. Um, we've got partners in this space. We do this for customers. We've got tons of people that have done this themselves, and we can help you no matter where you are, like financially or politically inside your organizations, we can help you build CDC. The last part that no one tells you is sort of this sort of opportunity to build domains. So if I look at one legacy host system, I might find customer, product, billing, uh, preferences. I might find a lot of domains worth of information in a particular data model. And these can be really com confusing. If you now weave in the fact that I've got 55 different mainframes that I've got to work with, I'm not going to have one data team that figures out all these legacy data models and all of the tables and IMS segments. I really want to say, OK, for the, for the first fo folks in the row here, you guys are going to be the policy team. And you guys are going to own the policy change data capture process. You're also going to own the have the responsibility of, of, of the data archaeology, unearthing these legacy data models just for the policy tables, not the whole enchilada. I just want you to look at the policy tables, make sense of them, understand the legacy sources, and then understand the target data model that you move the data into, and then understand the APIs that you built on top of that. So you can become really, really deep and experts in that one domain. And then if I have a billing team and a customer team and a product team, now I can start to scale a program. Now it's not this insurmountable giant monster. Now I can have five or six domains worth of teams starting to chip away at that problem. The second thing is really make sure that's event-based. In my opinion, the best CDC jobs are event-based because once you open up that fire hose of legacy deltas that are flowing into the, a distributed production application, there are going to be times where you're going to want to shut that hose off. You're going to want to shut that pipeline off to work on the target microservices, to work on the target data model. But you don't want to lose deltas. And so what an event-based process will give you, whether you use MQQ or Kafka uh, or Amazon Kinesis or MSK, you basically want to be able to shut the pipe off, let the deltas from the legacy system accrue, do your work on the microservice, bring your microservice back up, and then turn the pipe back on and play the deltas that you've, you've missed over the last couple hours of time. Really, really important here. So where to move the data? I mean, where else are you going to move this data but MongoDB? I'm smitten with MongoDB. I fell in love with MongoDB as a data architect at Travelers because I was able to do so many things that I couldn't in relational. Um, I'm even more smitten that I, that I work here now you know, since joining the company. But definitely, where to move the data, you can use any database on the planet. But the rationale behind, in my opinion, why MongoDB is all about the document. Like Andrew talked about this morning, it's the document model. The document model is so good. When we exchange information, complicated information over the internet, we're using JSON schema. Why? Because you know, if, if I open up the weather app on my phone and I pass a zip code into an API, I'm getting the week's worth of data back. I'm not getting six or seven tables worth of data back. I'm getting one payload that has all these nested relationships in one really elegant package. <clears throat> and the document model uh, is so good, in my opinion, that we've got folks like Cosmos DB, Amazon Document DB, and even Oracle now emulating the document model, emulating what MongoDB does. Because I think JSON and the document model are now king. They've won out. And now the question is really, why MongoDB? Which platform do you want for that document model? I think MongoDB is great because you can do joins. Uh, from a data architecture perspective, as you start uncovering legacy data models, you have no idea what you're going to unearth. Typically, those legacy data models are great because they were built by 
uh, old school data modelers maybe 20, 30 years ago, and they had to get it right the first time, and they usually did get it right. Um, and then sort of why Atlas, you know, sort of MongoDB helps you scale. But, you know, one kind of interesting fact here is if you download MongoDB and you run it on your laptop, that's the same server code base that will be run in your data center if you're self-managing MongoDB. And it's the same code base that if you come to Atlas and you provision an Atlas cluster, that MongoDB process, or what's called the MongoDB process, same code. So you can literally write a program on your laptop and then change the connection string and point it to Atlas and know that it'll work. So if you're uh, in an organization like many of us are, where maybe you're cloud hesitant or the leadership is cloud hesitant, build it on-prem now and know that with a simple connection string, you can move that thing to Atlas and scale it. Um, on the left here, this is actually 14 of those 17 IMS segments that I told you about uh, with one of our insurance customers. They had a 17 segment data model for auto insurance policies. We did some analysis on the volume of data and we determined that we could put that in one MongoDB collection. So 17 IMS segments of complexity all get wrapped up into this target data model on the right hand side and the nice thing about MongoDB, in my opinion, is that you don't lose relationships. Whether it's relational or it's hierarchical IMS, your data always has relationships. And in MongoDB, we have arrays. We have embedded sub-documents. We have these, these repeating groups that are relationships in IMS or relational. We preserve them. We just don't have to have separate database objects always. We might want a separate database object to handle unbounded growth, and we might want to join that after the fact. But this is an example of how, how simplified you can, you can make some of the work for your developers. So once you get the data out of the host, I'm not dealing with um, 20, 20 relational objects for the developers to work with. And in fact, as you add up those 55 different policy issuance systems, you're probably gonna have 55 different data models that somehow have to fit into one target data model. Having something like the document model where you can embed relationships instead of having separate database objects, is gonna go a long way in terms of developer productivity and then eventually having to scale your program. Once you get that data out of the host, you're gonna to wanna to deliver a feature to your product owner. The order of, the, the amount of time it takes for a developer to write against MongoDB versus um, relational or, or uh, tar, uh, hierarchical IMS, there's an order of magnitude of time difference here. This is an interesting graph. Um, the mythical man month, you know, can, can we, can nine months, can nine women in one month have one baby? You know, can we throw more people at this? When we throw more teams at a particular problem, when we have 55 systems that issue policies, things are complicated. Um, if I have 55 tables, whereas I could have maybe one MongoDB document, one model is gonna be a lot more complicated than the other. And this kind of speaks to that. The more volume that you have, the more complexity that you get. Here's kind of something neat. The MongoDB schema really allows you to kind of incrementally change your schema. So one of the things you're gonna get into a religious war with is over the target data model. This is a really short, simple example here, but here's some uh, insurance policies. And as you incrementally discover your, your source data models, you're gonna to wanna to now incrementally design a target data model. I want a canonical schema, sort of one that can rule them all but I also want to preserve legacy uniqueness. And this is really hard to do with relational. You end up with all these super type, subtype tables. You end up with these big tables where there's 300, you know, 200 columns, but 80% of them are null for any given row. In MongoDB, we can do something like have a coverage array. And in that coverage array, the API can always, the API can take a policy number in, go get the data, and then pass back to the user the coverages. I don't have to know what's in that coverage array. I can actually take whatever's in this IMS system or whatever's in this DB2 system and put it in that one array called coverage so I have a, a brand new target schema, sort of the skeletal canonical model, and I have all that legacy uniqueness under the hood. We're close on time here. So scaling a program, in my opinion, I use this Gary Vaynerchuk quote, give, 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 and then ask for business. You have to wow your product owners out of the gate because they're gonna be skeptical. Maybe they're skeptical about NoSQL. Maybe they've been told that it's gonna to cost hundreds of millions of dollars to get away from the mainframes. 
If you can get your data out into a really elegant target data model and then within a couple of weeks deliver an enterprise search capability using maybe MongoDB search, this is how you're gonna wow your business owners. <clears throat> We've been in your shoes. Um, have a conversation with us. Um, again, this is a, usually a 90 minute presentation. I've tried to boil the essence of really kind of what matters here in legacy modernization uh, into a handful of items, but have a conversation with us. Find your sales rep. Um, I'm sure they will find you <laughs> if you don't find them. Um, and let's have a conversation around what that means. We also have a network of people uh, in terms of like partners um, who can help with coding, planning, you name it. So in summary here, digital readiness. We want to we want to compete with the digital leaders. We want to take our use cases and ensure that they are digitally ready, that we can use machine learning, we can use automation, we can uh, incorporate IoT device, connected device data. We want to bring our mainframes into this new digital era without the cost and time of replacing them. And I think that's really based upon platform architectures and single view domains. Emulate the leaders, emulate the architecture that they're building, and then monetize that data in the mainframe. Don't replace the mainframe. Just leverage it and be able to work with it a little bit more easily than in, in its current form. If you can, please fill out the survey, QR code here. Uh, but I'll stop now. The clock says 30 seconds. Um, so I'll stop for 30 seconds worth of Q&A if, uh, if anybody has questions. Well, actually, yeah. Sure, Jeff. <laughs> Hold on a sec, sorry, I have to make a quick announcement. We're actually, it's 30 seconds over. So I just wanna, I, if, oh, folks, right. if folks wanna stick around, cause you're, yeah, I mean, as you said, 90 minutes into 30 was fantastic. If you have a question, please come up and see Jeff. I wanna just give instructions, um, cause I don't wanna hold this room back. Lunch is uh, being served out in the front parking lot. Food trucks, so find your magic out there. As Jeff mentioned, please capture the QR code. Uh, before you head out to give some feedback. And Jeff, you're going to hang around a little bit if, if folks want to have some questions. But sure. yeah, otherwise, sure, yeah. Yeah. Uh, grab lunch and then uh, sessions resume uh, sharply, I think, at 1. So we'll see you all back here in a little bit. Enjoy. Thanks, Jeff. Round of applause. Thanks, folks. Thank you for your time. Appreciate it.